So let's cultivate our motivation. And the quotation that I read last week is very powerful for getting us to think about karma and think about compassion as well. So in the Dharmapada, the Buddha said, Mind is the forerunner of all miserable states. It is mind that leads the way, just as the wheel of the cart follows the hoof of the ox. So suffering will surely follow when we speak or act impulsively from an impure state of mind. So a mind that lacks compassion, a mind that's completely involved in... Uh, ourselves and the eight worldly concerns that mind will create negativity and then as a cart follows the the footprints of the ox then suffering comes upon us and then the Dhammapada uh, continues mind is the forerunner of all happy states It is mind that leads the way. Just as our shadow never leaves us, so well-being will surely follow when we speak or act from a pure state of mind. So compassion, genuine love, not attachment, those are pure states of mind. They are not based on self-grasping ignorance. So... Realizing emptiness does not destroy them in the same way that the realization of emptiness uh, obliterates all the mental afflictions that are the cause of our dukkha. So understanding that compassion benefits ourselves and it benefits others and that there's absolutely no harm to it, then let's wish that, generate that wish for ourselves and others to have happiness. Not just happiness in samsara, but really the happiness that comes from the Dharma, the happiness that is liberation and full awakening. And let's make that the purpose of our life, because if we do, then we are will continually be creating virtuous karma and continually contributing to the well-being of society and of all sentient beings. So let's make that our motivation for sharing the teachings this evening. I want to share another quote that we went over last week because some of these quotes are very pithy and they really say it quite directly. So beings are the owners of their karma, heirs of their karma. They originate from their karma. Yeah, karma is, you know, created by afflictions, which is underlain by ignorance. And karma is what gives forth rebirth uh, in samsara. So, uh, beings are bound to their karma, have karma as their refuge. So if we have virtuous karma, that's our refuge. If we don't, difficult. It is karma that distinguishes beings as inferior and superior. So it's not your wealth, it's not your fame, it's not your good looks, it's not your athletic ability. Yeah, it's not your praise, it's not your reputation. Yeah, 
That's not what uh, actually distinguishes beings as inferior and superior, or as maybe we should say successful and not successful, or as people who have led meaningful lives and people who haven't. Okay, so it's uh, the workings of our mind and then the physical, verbal, and mental uh, actions that, you know, determine all of this. And the thing with karma is it works, it applies to us, it functions whether we believe in it or not. And there's no way to bargain with karma. There's no way to negotiate, okay? If we did an action, we're going to experience the result, yeah? According to our motivation, according to the action we did, how we did the action, if we completed it or not, if we rejoiced in it or not, okay? So all these things, uh, you know, factor into our actions which will influence what we experience and there's nobody to go to to say uh excuse me but uh your your uh, invoice is correct is incorrect here and uh you know you say that i have the karma for a lower rebirth but uh, I didn't really do the things that you have listed on this invoice. I did all these other things that aren't listed on the invoice. So you need to correct your records, and then uh, I'll take a good rebirth, and so cancel that order for uh, a flight to the hell realms. You know, there's no one who you can go and bargain with. Because there's nobody who set the system up. Yeah? It just is a system of causality. It's like, you know, if you drop something from the rail here, it's going to fall down, whether you believe in gravity or not, you know? And even if you think it shouldn't fall down, because it would be much better if it went up, who are you going to go to to complain about gravity? You know, and say the ball shouldn't fall down. You know, there's nowhere. So, you know, when it says we are the heirs of our karma, you know, it's true. We created the cause, we experienced the result, and there's, you know, nobody to complain to, nobody to bellyache to, no reason to feel sorry for ourselves. Yeah. And yet, when misfortune comes, what do we do? We bellyache, we complain, and we blame somebody else. Yeah. And that just shows that we have no you know, that we have no idea really of how life works, how the universe works. We have no idea if, you know, if we behave in that way. Yeah. Or we may have an intellectual idea, but when it comes, push comes to shove, uh, you know, it's out the window. So, it's quite interesting when, you know, when misfortune comes, we always go, why me? What did I do to deserve this? You know, I'm such a nice person. How come this happened to me? But when good things happen to, to us, we never say, why me? Do we? Yeah, we only say, why me, when it's bad stuff we don't want, because we feel the universe is unjust. But when it's good stuff, then it's like, yeah, I deserve that, and I even deserve more. So universe, you should give me more. Yeah. So somehow, our way of thinking 
is a bit off, don't you think? Yeah. It's hard to kind of acknowledge this, but, uh, you know, there often is a gap between the Dharma we study and reflect on and how we respond in actual situations. Yeah? And so what we're trying to do through practice is close that gap. Yeah? So that the Dharma is really integrated in our life and our whole way of seeing things is different. You know, between now and then, we have to be very vigilant and observe how our mind reacts. And when it's, you know, off in left field, we need to bring it back and remind it of how life works. (laughs) Yeah, and keep bringing it back and trying again and working at it, you know, this whole process of integration. Okay, so the we have quite a bit, quite a few chapters here about karma. And uh, the first topic that we'll cover in it is the general characteristics of karma. So these are characteristics that all karma, uh, that pertain to all karma, whether it's virtuous or not virtuous. Okay, so it kind of lays the ground for how karma works. <clears throat> so, karma has four general characteristics. Understanding these provides us the basic framework to understand karma and its effects. Okay, so first one, karma is definite. Okay, what does that mean? It means happiness comes from previously created constructive actions and suffering comes from previously created destructive ones. It never occurs the other way around. And this part I think is quite interesting. An action is not inherently good or bad, but it is designated as virtuous or non-virtuous or neutral in relation to the result it brings. So the Buddha did not create the system of karma. What he did is, through his supernormal powers, observe when sentient beings experience happiness, he looked at the karmic cause for that happiness and called those actions virtue. When sentient beings experience misery, he looked at the karmic causes of the, that misery He called those non-virtue. So something becomes virtuous or non-virtuous, not because it has some inherent nature, but with uh, uh, in in relation to the result it brings. So this is an example of what we call mutual dependence of the three kinds of dependence. Yeah, this one is mutual dependence. Yeah, so non-virtue and virtue are, you know, uh, described in relation to each other, and they're also described in relationship to the results that they bring. Okay, so, you know, uh, sometimes, like in a court of law, we may get convicted and say, well, that's not fair, and that's a really dumb law. And why did the legislature make that? They should repeal it. But when dealing with karma matters, nobody made any laws. It's just the way things function. Yeah. And it it makes sense. And it's a karmic form of, you know, how thing, how cause and effect works. So we just have to learn it and learn how to live wisely within that system of cause and effect. Nobody created any laws that are unjust. That's not it. You know, the thing is when there's a non-virtuous mind and harm to others or harm to ourselves, 
and it gets called non-virtuous and it brings suffering. That's it. Okay. Uh, so the Abhidharma says, karma that yields happiness is virtuous karma. Karma that yields the unhappiness of suffering is non-virtuous karma. The other karma, which creates a neutral feeling, is the other neutral karma. Okay? So it's given its name in terms of its result. Pali commentaries explain nuances of the term virtue and non-virtue. From a psychological and spiritual viewpoint, non-virtue indicates something that is psychologically or spiritually unhealthy. Okay, we all want to be healthy. So, you know, if we want to be psychologically and spiritually healthy, we want to avoid non-virtue. From an ethical perspective, uh, non-virtue is to be censured and shown disapproval. In other words, it's not something that the wise recommend. <laughs> From the standpoint of its cause, it is produced by defilements. And from the viewpoint of its result, it produces suffering. Contrarily, virtue is spiritually and psychologically healthy and beneficial, ethically commendable, not produced under the influence of gross defilements, and leads to fortunate results. Okay? So, you know, one thing that I think is quite important is if we're unhappy, okay, chances are there's some non-virtue either ripening or being created. Yeah? And so to look and look at that and see what's going on, you know, and to think, you know, I think it's quite interesting here, you know, Non-virtue is psychologically or spiritually unhealthy. Yeah, it brings suffering. So when we're unhappy, when we stew in things, when we fall into despair, we're psychologically unhealthy. And it's in some way or another related to non-virtue. Because the chief way that karma work, uh, the chief, not the only, you know, but one of the principal ways that karma ripens is in terms of the feeling aggregate. So unhappy feelings are always caused by non-virtue. Happy feelings are always caused by virtue. Okay? So, you know, check our mental health. <laughs> yeah? Check your mental health. And if you're unhappy and you're upset and you're angry, you know, something is in terms of your attitude, your motivation, the actions you're doing, something is out of kilter. So here's another quote from the Buddha. If, friends, one who enters and dwells amid unwholesome states could dwell happily in this very life without vexation, despair, and fever, and if with the breakup of the body after death he could expect a good destination, then the Blessed One would not praise the abandoning of unwholesome states. Yeah, if unwholesome states brought happiness, the Buddha would not say avoid them. Yeah. But because one who enters and dwells amid unwholesome states dwells in suffering in this very life with vexation, despair, and fever, and because he can expect a bad destination with the breakup of the body after death, the Blessed One praises the abandoning of unwholesome states. 
I have kind of a hunch here. Yeah. That very often when we are confused, when uh, the mind is upset, it's because ethically something has gotten messed up in our life. And so I sometimes wonder when people seek uh, psychological help or therapy, how much, you know, uh, their, their angst is due to uh, non-virtue that they're presently being involved in or experiencing the result of previous non-virtue, okay? Somebody may do something, you know, quite deceitful to somebody else. Then they feel guilty. They blame themselves. They lose self-respect. Yeah. Then, you know, you, you want to go to a therapist to, to talk about your feelings about yourself and all. But I wonder if you look at how you're conducting your life, that may answer some of the reasons about why you're unhappy because the mind is involved in non-virtue. Yeah. What do you think? When you are angry, is your mind happy or unhappy? Does anger produce happiness, mental happiness? Or does anger produce mental unhappiness? It brings mental unhappiness, doesn't it? Nobody's jumping for joy when they're angry. So if, if you are unhappy in your life, you know, check and see, is there some jealousy? Is there some resentment? Is there some anger? Were actions done, you know, out of uh, belligerence or rebelliousness so that now you feel bad, you feel guilty, and that is part of the unhappiness? Do you see what I'm, what I'm getting at? You know, so, uh, you know, often... When we go to seek psychological help, we're talking about the other people and how to respond to the other people and so on and so forth. But maybe we need to also ask ourselves, how am I acting? And am I acting in ways that make me feel good about myself? Or am I acting and saying and thinking in ways that make me not respect myself because I want revenge, I want to retaliate, I want to get even, you know, or I'm feeling greedy. Uh, so just something to, to think about and, uh, and, you know, look at our, uh, the karma we've been creating and see how that influences our present happiness and unhappiness. Therapist, what do you think? Mm. Yeah, when I guess when people come to therapy for things that are going on Currently, oftentimes, there is that. You don't hear it immediately, but after some time, then you start hearing about being unfaithful to their partner or, you know, those kinds of things. Mm. But then th there's the other group of people that come to try and make sense of past mm -hmm. uh, things that have happened, like in their childhood and that kind of thing. And so I don't see that one so much connected. Yeah. Um, you don't think there's anger in those people who've had unfortunate things happen when they're kids and that sometimes holding mm -hmm. that anger? Sometimes anger, but uh, maybe anger toward themselves 
they feel like they caused it, yeah, in that way. Or angered towards the perpetrator of the harm. Yeah, that usually isn't the first thing that comes. It's more, mm. if things happen to you as a kid, you take it on, you did it, you know. Mm. So that has to get worked out. I and see. then after that, then the anger could come toward the other. And the then other finally, person, yeah. Yeah, then it comes to having some understanding of the whole thing, you know. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, something to think about in your life. So let me continue with the quote here. If, friends, one who enters and dwells amid wholesome states would dwell in suffering in this very life with vexation, despair, and fever, and if with the breakup of the body after death he could expect a bad destination, then the Blessed One would not praise the acquisition of wholesome states. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, so if virtue brought misery, Buddha's not going to praise it. But because one who, is, enters, one who enters and dwells amidst ho wholesome states dwells happily in this very life without fixation, despair, and fever, and because he can expect a good destination with the breakup of the body after death, the Blessed One praises the acquisition of wholesome states. Yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, something, spend some time thinking about it. See how your moods correspond with uh, having virtuous and non-virtuous thoughts. Yeah. When you help somebody, do you feel good about yourself afterwards or do you feel lousy? <laughs> yeah. Even you do something small to somebody, help somebody. Yeah. Do you feel lousy? Do you feel good? Yeah. When you dump your anger on somebody afterwards, do you feel lousy? Do you feel good? Okay. So, uh, I know for myself very often, you know, if I pick up some discontent in my mind, something is not right, if I check, you know, it's often because I said something or I was thinking something that was non-virtuous. Yeah. And so as a result, there's this discomfort in the mind. Yeah, it's, the mind is not comfortable. Anyway, check for yourself to see if, if that's true for you. Okay, here's um, another quotation from the questions of the Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva Sarata Sutra. As in planting, happiness and misery are effects from the deeds performed. How can a bitter sweet yield a sweet a bitter seed yield a sweet fruit. Seeing this universal truth, the wise should think, evil doing brings painful effects, while good deeds always lead to peace and happiness. So then somebody's going to say, well, somebody else harmed me, and I was really mad, and I got even with him. I talked behind his back and ruined his reputation, and I trashed him. I feel so good about it. Yeah. So then somebody said, well, he just created non-virtue, but he feels happy. Do you think that that feeling of self-satisfaction from having retaliated and harmed somebody, do you think that person actually in their heart feels happy? You know, think of your own experience when you got even with somebody or told somebody off. You know, initially there might be this surge of power. I stuck up for myself. I did it. I gave them a taste of their own medicine. Yeah, so initially the feeling of power, happiness, I did it. But then... Yeah, does that happiness last very long? 
or what comes, you know. Often we've, we've hurt somebody, we've harmed them, we feel guilty, or we feel fearful because they're going to retaliate against us now. Or we feel worried about what might come. Yeah. So just, just observe and check. You know, people it, with tweeting now, they tweet so many amazing things that, you know, I wonder would you would they ever say to somebody's face? Maybe they do. I don't know if they some of the things people tweet would they ever say to a human being standing right in front of them? Or do you know? I mean, if they would, my goodness, and they have to totally block out that the other person's a human being with feelings, you know. And so people may tweet stuff and go, oh, good. But, yeah, what, is it, what does it do to, to your own conscience and your own feeling about yourself? I, I was very impressed the other day when Mitt Romney was, uh, I can't produce his quote exactly. Maybe somebody can look it up or somebody remembers it better than I do. But he, he was saying that, um, you know, you have to live by your conscience. Uh, and he was saying, I'm, you know, too old now to not do that. Yeah? And that your conscience, you know, we have a conscience and we may tell our conscience to shut up, but it, it kind of hangs in there. Now, granted, sometimes our conscience uh, feels bad about things that are not our fault. We blame ourselves for things that are not our responsibility. But sometimes, you know, we refuse to look at things that are our responsibility. And so I was uh, impressed with what Romney said. Um, yeah. He kind of insinuated that he had act for self profit in the past, and now he's seeing he can't do. He doesn't want to do that anymore. And when some reporter asked him, "Well, what kind of things do you mean?" he said, "I'm not going to tell you." Yeah, but I think you know at least one senator is standing up and saying something about the power of virtue and the power of how you feel about yourself. So it may seem that some people experience satisfaction after engaging in destructive actions, such as taking revenge on another person. The immediate pleasure they experience is due to their distorted way of thinking, while the result of their present action will be suffering in the future. Okay, so it's a distorted way of thinking that makes us feel happy when we create non-virtue. Similarly, someone may go through physical difficulties doing prostrations, but the long-term result of this action will be happiness. So how you feel immediately when the action is happening is not the... Uh, the sign of whether it's virtuous or non-virtuous. It's the long-term result. Okay. Then the second uh, general quality of karma is that it, it is expandable in that a small action can bring a large effect in the same way that a small seed can produce a large tree. Understanding this protects us from being complacent, thinking, this is only a tiny action. I don't need to bother with it. Okay. You were talking about this in your BBC the other day, you know. Oh, it's just a, the defilement is weak. It's just a small one, you know. I'll follow it. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. But what this point is saying is that a small seed can grow into a big tree. So don't think this is just small. Don't bother with it. 
Instead, we will uh, take care to avoid small destructive actions and engage in small constructive ones. So the groups of utterances, the Udana Varga councils, okay, like a poison that has been ingested, the commission of even a small negativity creates in your lives hereafter great fear and a terrible downfall. So don't poo-poo negativities. As when grain ripens into a bounty, even the creation of small merit leads in lives uh, hereafter to great happiness and will be immensely meaningful as well. So also small virtuous actions that we do can have a big effect. So don't just say, oh, well, it's small, why should I do it, you know? And so like setting up your altar in the morning, you know? Oh, it's just, you know, kind of offering water bowls. That doesn't create very much merit. And, you know, so I'd rather sleep the extra five minutes. You know, it's a small action, but um, things become heavier the more we do them. Yeah? And so every morning you start out the day, you know, creating some virtue in that way. Or, and that's the... The benefit of following a schedule here at the Abbey is that every day you're implanting those seeds of virtue in your mind, and uh, and it becomes easy because everybody's doing it, so you do what everybody else does, yeah, and uh, and then it really works. It builds up the virtue over time. So that's really why it's important to have a a regular uh, daily practice. Not a daily practice that, you know, one day a week, it's like I'm sitting in meditation hours, eight hours a day, you know, and then the rest of the week you don't do anything. Yeah, it's much better just do a little bit each day and keep building on that good energy. Then the third um, quality of uh, general quality of karma, karma, as we will not experience the effect of uh, an action we have not done. So if we have not created the cause to experience a contagious disease, we will not contract it, even though others around us may. If we do not create the causes to attain awakening, we will not, even though we make many prayers to the Buddha to gain realizations. Okay? So the uh, praise of the exalted one says, The Brahmins say that virtue and negativity may transfer to others, like giving and receiving a gift. You, the Buddha, taught that one, what one has done does not perish and that one does not meet the effects of what one has not done. So I remember after 9-11, we heard so many different stories, you know. Um, I remember there was one man, he worked in the Twin Towers usually every day, but that day his child was uh, starting school. So he didn't go to work. He took his child to school. So he lived even though, you know, his whole workplace crumbled. So that's a good example of, you know, if you don't create the cause, you don't experience the result. Then there were other people who didn't work in the Twin Towers. But that day, for one reason or another, they had some business there, so they happened to be there when the planes hit. Yeah? And so again, you know, if the cause is created, then the result comes about. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's something to really think about. And it accounts for all these kind of strange things that happen 
when things don't turn out the way we think they should, according to our short, uh, our, our short uh, vision experience of, of watching how things unfold. Yeah. So they often give the example, like in, in India, uh, whatever business you have, usually all the, the people who do business, let's say in car repair, they're all on one street. Yeah. Here, you know, they're kind of located or different places around the city for convenience. But in some countries, all the care, you know, or most of the car repairs are on one street. And most of the uh, tailors are on another street and like this. So sometimes you may have a whole row of, you know, different shops selling the same thing. And one will be very prosperous and the next one won't. And, you know, the example that my teachers often gave for that or is, or the ex explanation is that if someone has created virtue before, then they will get more business. And the guy who hasn't created as much virtue, uh, even though they're next door, you know, won't get all, won't get so much business. Yeah. So things, things like that happen too. And it's funny sometimes, you know, you apply for something and you think, I'm very well qualified. And then you're not chosen for it. And somebody who seems less well qualified is chosen. Yeah. So if we create the cause, it happens. If we don't create the cause, it doesn't happen. Yeah. And so here, um, you know, definitely, thinking about our awakening, that we have to create the cause for it. Yeah, it's, it's not a thing of uh, making prayers and having, uh, you know, wishes and feeling, you know, things of faith where we get shivers down our back. You know, uh, it's creating virtue. Okay, so there's a lot of things we can do that look spiritual that aren't, you know, the, the mind isn't virtuous, it's the action itself isn't even an action created with intention, yeah. So we have to create the causes to, if we want those results. But it's funny how our mind works, you know, even in terms of, of worldly ways. We know how karma or how cause and effect works. If you want a certain job, you need to do the training, you know, or if you, you don't want such and such to happen uh, in your portfolio, then don't act in a certain way. And yet we know this, and yet we just do whatever and somehow expect that cause and effect is going to work differently for us. You know, I don't have to study for the test. I'm just going to go in there cold, but I'll ace it. Yeah, we still expect that. So there might be somebody who has a very good memory and who studied the, the whole term so they don't need to cram the night before. Yeah, so maybe somebody like that. But for the, you know, for that person, they have created the cause. The rest of us? <laughs> so it's, it's very strange how we think. Mm -hmm. Then the fourth uh, general characteristic karmic seeds do not get lost or magically vanish. So the effect of an action will be experienced unless it is counteracted. Okay? So the basis of Vinaya, the Vinaya Vastu says, even in 100 eons, karma does not perish. When the circumstances and the time arrive, being surely feel its effects. So the karma is not going to get lost, even though the time between when it was 
created and when it ripens is a very, very long time. Okay? So unless a karmic seed is counteracted, it will one day bring its results. Seeds from destructive actions are inhibited from ripening by the four opponent powers that are explained below. So we'll get to them soon uh, in this class and also in Bodhicharya Avatar. We're coming, uh, the next verse will explain them. Seeds from constructive actions are thwarted by anger and wrong views. Okay, so if we've created negativity, purify. Yeah? And if we've created virtue, um, make, you know, really guard the mind against anger and wrong views. Although karmic seeds do not get lost, events are not predetermined. The ripening of karma is an interdependent occurrence with many contributing factors and variables. We do not know what the future will be until it happens. Okay, because some people uh, get very, con they concretize karma, thinking that, you know, I hit you in this life, so next life you hit me, you know. And then they come up with questions of, uh, you know, yeah, what happens if, and then in the next, like, I, I've changed and I don't feel like hitting you back. Um, well, no, it's not that the person that we've harmed in one life is necessarily the person who harms us in the next life, okay? It just means we've created the karma to be harmed, and somehow, some way, uh, you know, that karma will ripen. It doesn't have to be the exact same person. And it doesn't have to be that we experience the exact same thing that we made somebody else feel, you know. So sometimes, you know, the idea gets really kind of, uh, yeah, concretized in, in a way where uh, people start feeling like it, it means you're fated, and it, it doesn't. There's a lot of flexibility in karma if we know how to use it. Okay, and hold on. So what is not flexible is virtue produces happiness and non-virtue produces suffering. Okay, so that's not going to flex. But within that, how a virtuous karma ripens, how a non-virtuous karma ripens, there's a lot of uh, room how that can change depending upon... Um, you know, whether we do the action repeatedly, whether we've purified it at all or destroyed it at all, whether, you know, what's going on in the environment with the cooperative conditions. So there's lots and lots of, of things that influence exactly how something ripens. And about the um, scriptures talk about bodhisattvas receiving a prediction of their... Mm. Future awakening. How mm. does that? How does that work in relationship to this? Mm. There, I think it must be that somebody has created such an amazing, incredible amount of virtue, um, and they are at a stage of the path where they're not going to regress. Yeah. So these predictions, they they don't happen to common people. Yeah. They, had, they happen to people who have been practicing for a long time, who have some realizations, who have a great collection of merit. So I think, you know, when you have a lot of that going in, a same, in, in one direction, then, you know, a Buddha can make a prediction like that. Of course, if that bodhisattva all of a sudden decides that they're going to blow it, and, you know, trash everything they've spent eons creating, then maybe the prediction won't, you know, come out the way it was said. Okay. <laughs> okay, so those, those are the four uh, general characteristics of karma. Now we're going into the specific characteristics where we're going to talk about 
uh, specific actions, you know, what to practice, what to avoid. So the main focus of initial level practitioners is to bring about a series of precious human lives in the future so that our Dharma practice can, t- can continue without interruption. Okay, so that's our primary thing. Long term, we motivate for full awakening. But primary, we have to keep ourselves out of the lower realms. Okay? Because if we take a lower rebirth, then it's going to be very hard to get out. Okay? So, attaining that uh, kind of rebirth it entails creating the causes, and that entails having a good understanding of the specific characteristics of karma. Okay? So the harmful uh, karmic paths that cause unfort- unfortunate rebirths or otherwise hinder our ability to practice, and constructive karmic paths that bring fortunate rebirths and circumstances conducive for Dharma practice. So in this life, in this light, the Buddha outlined 10 non-virtues to abandon and 10 virtues to practice. These 10 subsume the significant karmic paths to pay attention to, although they do not encompass all physical, verbal, and mental actions. Okay, so they don't include everything, but they include the the principal things. Okay, so the Buddha set these out. Okay, so what is the bad? (laughs) Okay, the destruction of life, so killing, taking what is not given or stealing, unwise sexual conduct, false speech, or lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, idle talk, covetousness, maliciousness, and wrong views. So there's the 10. And what is good? Abstinence from the destruction of life, from taking what is not given, from unwise sexual conduct, from false speech, from divisive speech, from harsh speech, from idle talk, non-covetousness, goodwill, and right views. Okay? So just abandoning a non-virtuous action itself is a virtuous action. Okay? And in addition, doing the opposite of the non-virtuous action is also a virtuous action. Okay, so the Buddha continues describing these two sets of karmic paths respectfully as igno- ignoble, is that how you say it? Ignoble. And noble, harmful and beneficial, non dharma and dharma, polluted and unpolluted, blameworthy and blameless, tormenting and untormenting, leading to suffering and to happiness building up the round of rebirth and diminishing it to be abandoned and to be cultivated. So when he went through these 10, he talked about how they were all of these, you know, things. The the non-virtuous ones were part, the, the virtuous ones were part. Okay. When they talk about something being blameworthy or blameless, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to blame you and say you're a, non, a bad person, you know. It means in terms of uh, the wise, the people that we respect, the people who practice well, who have integrity, you know, what do they see as, as pure behavior? What do they see as defiled behavior? Okay, so when it talks about blameworthy and um, and blameless, that's what it means. So it's kind of uh, telling us we should, uh, in general, we're encouraged, don't care about our reputation or what other people think. But when it comes to what the wise think, we should care about what they think. 
Because as the wise look at us and say, what are they doing? You know, then we should heed that. And if the wise say, you know, what you're doing is good, then we should heed that, heed that as well. Okay. So of the ten non-virtues, three are done physically. Killing, stealing, and unwise and unkind sexual behavior. So the Buddha describes them. There is a person who destroys life. He is cruel and his hands are bloodstained. He is bent on slaying and murdering, having no compassion for any living being. Okay, then says the first one. He takes what is not given to him, appropriates with thievish, thievish intense, intent the property of others, be it in the village or in the forest. So that's not just the kind, we'll go through this later, but it, that's not just the kind of crime of stealing somebody's physical property like a burglar would. It includes white-collar crime, you know, and cheating people out of money, extorting people, um, leading people to make bad business deals, you know, when you know it's going to turn out bad, um, cheating people in a business deal, these kinds of things as well. Okay, then he conducts himself wrongly in matters of sex. He has intercourse with those under the protection of father, mother, brother, sister, relatives, or clan, or of their religious community, or with those engaged to a fiancé, protected by law, and even with those betrothed with a garland. Garland. So somebody who's under the protection of their parents or some other relative who looks after them and makes sure they're safe, um, or the religious community, so somebody who's taken precepts, uh, you don't have sex with them, somebody who's engaged, who's protected by law. Not sure what that one's about. Uh, oh, it's probably like not to have uh, sex with minors and things like that, things that are, are legally prohibited. And even with those betrothed with the garland, that's how you got engaged. Uh, in ancient times, no, uh, no diamond rings and no kneeling and, you know. So your family does it. Yeah. It's a, yeah, in ancient times, it's a joy. It's a, a cooperation between two families and the kids just hope they like each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. For, I hope we go, I want to make sure. Yeah. Okay. So four non-virtues are done verbally. Lying, divisive speech, our speech, and idle talk. So the Buddha expounds on these. There is one who tells lies. Really? Really? People lie. In America? There is one who tells lies. When he is in the council of his community or in another assembly or among his relatives, his guild, in the royal court, or when he has been summoned as a witness and is asked to tell what he knows, then, though he does not know, he says, I know. Though he does know, he says, I do not know. Though he has not seen, he says, I have seen. And though he has seen, he says, I have not seen. In that way, he utters deliberate lies, be it for his own sake, for the sake of others, or for some material advantage. Okay. Makes me think of the... Uh, uh, you know, what happened with the impeachment, you know, the interviews for the impeachment, and then what people said about things before, you know, before, during that, and 
how people got punished for telling the truth. So they may get punished as a result of negative karma created in past lives by having their career harmed, like Colonel Vind Vindman did. Yeah. But in terms of karma, yeah, he created incredible virtuous karma. And he will have a clear conscience because he did what's right and he acted with integrity. You know, and some people in the government, I don't know how they live with themselves. I really don't. You know, how you can lie just up front to the whole country, how you can, yeah, these things, it's, <laughs> it's amazing to me that somebody would have the confidence to do that and not care about the number of people that they're harming. You know, lying to one person is bad. Lying to millions of people, lying to the entire planet? You know, how can people live with themselves afterwards? You know, I, it's, it's hard to understand. Oh, okay, so here's Mitt's quote. <laughs> he says, I've learned that if you don't follow your conscience, it haunts you for a long, long time. Uh, at this stage in life, I'm not going to do that anymore. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. He's acting according to his conscience. And he was the one Republican who did during the Senate impeachment hearing, too. Huh? Yeah, I was reading the, gov the governor of Maryland. No, yeah, Maryland. He's been quite vocal about the president. And his father apparently was in, uh, I think, the Senate, or maybe it was the House, during the Nixon era. And he was the sole Republican who voted for impeachment for Nixon. You know, but he uh, has the image of his father and the, you know, and apparently a lot of people were mad at his father. He lost friends. He lost contacts over it, you know, but he's somebody who lived according to his conscience. And it's nice that as a child, you know, the present Maryland governor thinks of his father and wants to act in the same way. Yeah. Okay. So that was about lying. Or he utters divisive words. What he hears, he reports elsewhere to foment conflict there. And what he hears elsewhere, he reports here to foment conflict here. Okay. Oh, there's a lot of people who do that nowadays, isn't it? Yeah. Let's stir things up. Thus he creates discord amongst those united, and he incites still more those who are in discord. He is fond of dissension. He delights and rejoices in it, and he utters words that cause dissension. So some people love creating chaos. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, chaos in general, it can mean uh, being the leader of a faction that gangs up on one person. Sometimes in workplaces this happens. Yeah, this is, how, this is, it's very interesting. This is how you bond with other people, often in a work situation, by ganging together and criticizing together one person over there. 
So the fact that you all agree that that person's a jerk and should be fired is what bonds you together with another person. What kind of bond of friendship is that? Yeah, when the glue that makes you call somebody a friend is the glue of uh, dividing people and creating conflict between the person, you know, the black sheep that you're blaming and everybody else in the office. Okay, and here I think of sixth grade. You've heard me talk about this before. So maybe we all know, although maybe you aren't like me, but I went to a school where in sixth grade, everybody except the kids who were left out uh, belonged to a little clique. Yeah, did you have that at your school? Everybody had their own little group that they belonged to. So I was part of a group. We were six girls. Yeah. And I don't know what brought us together anymore. But anyway, uh, you know, this was our little clique and we spent time together. And every Friday we wrote up a list of, um, the people that we liked and the people we didn't like in the class. Oh, we were terrible. We were horrible, you know. And then we would sh share our lists, you know. Somebody went up, somebody went down. So one day, I don't know why, but I decided that I didn't want Rosie Knox in the group anymore. I have no idea why. Rosie was one of my friends. So I did this exact thing. You know, I because with divisive speech, I found some reason to criticize Rosie to the other four girls, yeah, and get get it so that we all decided together to kick Rosie out of our group. So we did that, and that was fomented by me, I confess. So Rosie was out. Then... The next week, they got together and they kicked me out of the group. <laughs> and I didn't understand why they kicked me out of the group. <laughs> so it took me a while to, you know, to kind of get it that you foment discard, discord, and it's going to come back and whack you. Yeah? So then I was out of the group, and who else was it? Gail Goodwin, Susie Arbenz. I can't remember who the other ones were. But I was out. And they took Rosie back in. <laughs> so, someday, I'm sure, I am hope, maybe Rosie will come to one of my talks and I'll be able to apologize to her. Her and Peter Armetta. That, that's another story. Okay. Do you have people from when you were really little that you look back on and you say, oh, my God, how? There's some other people from when I was young that I just treated so awfully for no good reason at all. You know, just being arrogant and wanting to put somebody down so that I could think that I was a big shot. And I, you know, this stuff done in grammar school. And dare I say we all did it? Anybody here who didn't do it? You know, you didn't? That meant you didn't go to school. 
Oh, what did you do? <laughs> this hangs me to this day. I've, I've done quite a bit of purification about this, but I was, um, I think it was fifth grade. And um, I kind of put together a little group and there were vendors outside of the school. And I put together a little group of girls to go out and steal some of the food from the vendors uh, outside. And uh, yeah, it's been, I, it took me a while to realize what I've done, but once it done on me, it's just been one of those things that really has hunt me for a long while. Yeah. So You didn't get caught. No, but I think the man knew, and I think the man was really kind, and he allowed me to get away with it. Uh -huh. I think he really knew what we were doing. It's not stupid. And um, I think the fact that I remember that <laughs> makes me feel even worse because he was just so incredibly kind, especially because um, he was so obviously very poor, and he was selling this food to sustain his family. Yeah. And I think he had kids, and I think that was part of it. He saw these fifth graders, and uh. he couldn't stop but think about his kids, is what I'm thinking, and that drove him to be much more kind than, than we were being, so. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, so those are the things, I don't know about you, but I, my first Vajrasattva retreat, boy, purifying things from sixth grade, from second grade, from, you know, all that stuff we did. Nasty. We were nasty, you know, and we weren't even the bad kids. Yeah, were you the bad kids? I wasn't, a, I wasn't one of the ones that people looked at, oh, she's a bad kid, but I was horrible. Yeah. Anyway, okay, um, he uses, uh, he speaks harshly using speech that is coarse, rough, bitter, and abusive, what makes others angry and causes distraction of mind. So that's creating, uh, that's the harsh words one, okay. So probably most of us have done a bit of that one too. Yeah. And then he indulges in idle chatter. He speaks what is untimely, unreasonable, and unbeneficial, having no connection with dharma or vinaya. His talk is not worth treasuring. It is inopportune, inadvisable, unrestrained, and harmful. And sometimes you just wish they'd shut up. And other times, they're telling you really good, juicy gossip that you want to hear. And sometimes it's us doing that talk. Okay. So we're going to stop here. So if there's any questions. Or comments. Are you all having flashbacks to <laughs> grammar school? <laughs> I think one of the, the biggest practices that I've had to work on for a long time regarding karma is that when I have a, when negative karma is ripening in my life and I recognize that I'm suffering and that I'm sorry, I don't know what caused it, but I, that I recognize that it came from some negative action I really want it to stop. Like I really think that my regret and my recognizing that this suffering was due to a negativity. Mm -hmm. The whole idea that it could be ripening for a really, really long time mm -hmm. is something that I have had a very hard time making peace with. Mm -hmm. And to be able to use it to deepen my self-acceptance and my own compassion and yeah. to be able to turn that outward when I see people get themselves into a lot of trouble and then watch the suffering results play for a period of time, that has been one of the harder ones mm. to see that once it starts to ripen, you can't say, okay, I understand, it's okay, you can stop now. You know, it's just, it just keeps going. Yeah, yeah. 
They say that, you know, once you break your leg, you can't unbreak it. You can mend it, but you can't unbreak it, yeah? And once, you know, we do something with a certain momentum, I guess I've never done downhill skiing, but maybe, you know, once you push off and you start on your way down, you may say, oh, I changed my mind, but... uh yeah, you still have to <laughs> go all the way down. I was just thinking when you had you back when you were talking about um, going into therapy and people looking seeking psychological help, mm -hmm. how um, how unfortunate it is that we've moved so far from ethics, even as a as a society, so that mm -hmm. even even we may recognize that that there's a disturbance in my mind that I can even see is based on my present behavior, but I don't know what what ethical conduct is. I don't know what a virtuous action is. I don't know what a non-virtuous action is. Mm -hmm. So even to be able to get somewhere to sort that out is necessary. It's not something that we, you know, overwhelmed by our karma and afflictions that we, we can easily find on our own. So yeah. you look at anywhere yeah. for the best source of guidance. And sometimes we get the correct guidance and sometimes we don't, and that just makes it worse. Yeah, yeah. But society isn't linking mm -mm. our present happiness and unhappiness with ethical conduct at all. No, not at all. Not even on, a, on the superficial level yeah. anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And yet I, I think it is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>